All clear. Nothing above, nothing below. Hola, chica. My name is Raymond. I'm in Toronto, and I'm in isolation. Are we? We're in the UK, and we're thinking we are, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I'm in my apartment, and I haven't left in more than about two weeks now. And I look out my building, and it's like, you know, dawn of the dead out there. So I'm safe up here. I'm popping out for cigarettes. How often? Um... More than I should be. Girl, buy them in bulk and only go once every week. <laughs> uh, I did buy two packets today, actually. Good girl. And, and two bottles of wine. But I may need to go back. What I am liking about the isolation, though, is that I get all the time in the world to watch my favorite movies. <laughs> that is beautiful. Yes. And what films are you watching at the present time? Well, interestingly enough, I recently got the special edition Blu-ray of John Carpenter's Starman, which is, of course, the sort of... Karen... Karen Allen? Karen Allen. And sexy, young Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he... We could, okay, so we couldn't do Sexy Man of Halloween. We could certainly do Sexy Man of John Carpenter films. Oh yeah, John Carpenter has sexy movies, has sexy dudes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, so my, my issue with that is, uh, what the fuck him? I don't know, but he is super sexy, Kurt Russell. Oh yeah, he's sexy, but I think he's also a Republican. <laughs> but yeah, like, I would totally blow Snake. Yeah, I don't know what it is about it, and I love a guy who has a, a sense of humor, first and foremost, but for some reason, Kurt Russell, even in like Big Trouble in Little China or any of the snake, snake movies, all two of them, it, it's not enough. It, 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 it's, uh, I don't know. It's like I'm halfway there, but I'm not living on a prayer. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not wanting him so much. No. But like Starman Jeff Bridges when he's all like shirtless and like, and he's so gentle and loving, and Karen Allen's like, oh my god, you look at my dead husband, I can't handle it, and I'm like, oh, it's so hot. Karen Allen, what else is she? She was in Superman. No, that was Margot Kidder. Karen Allen was Marion in Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right, that is right. I'm taking you for a little tour because my little baby is looking in from the kitchen. My little French Canadian footy cat. Come Where's, Where's Luca? I'll come say hi. So yeah, I, I was watching Starman and I love it because it's one of those anomalies in John Carpenter's career because it's, I mean, it's, it's a sci-fi road movie romance, but it's not scary. Um, he did not compose the music for it, but the music sounds like a John Carpenter score. Was it Howarth? Oh no, it was Jack Nietzsche, who, and it's, it was a Golden Globe nominated score. It's got like two or three main themes that repeat a lot, but it's like super 80s synthesizer. The love theme is beautiful and has been sampled in a bunch of other songs in the last couple of years. And the effects by ILM are great for like 1984, 85. Um, and it's a really touching little road movie, but it's sort of like, you, it's not an expected John Carpenter film, because it's like, it's super genteel. What year was that? I think it was 84. Okay, so it was right it, after... 85, yeah. So like, after Christine, but before Christine, Big Trouble. Christine was 83, 84? Yeah, yeah, I think 83. Yeah. Christine... Well, actually, I did hear, I'm not sure how accurate it is, I did. I do believe Steve, uh, Stephen King turned around and said it was one of his favorite adaptations from book to film. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah. And it's great looking, the soundtrack is awesome, you care about the characters. Um, it's cool seeing that little skinny nerd Keith Gordon become like a sexy greaser badass. Yeah. Influence. And also, I also enjoyed Alexandra Paul. Oh, 
from Baywatch. From Baywatch. I did see her in the, the 1995 remake of um, Piranha. And uh, I swear to God, the only line that she was given was, I, I'm assuming the guy, the main guy was Paul, funny enough. And uh, all she would say the whole way through, because we always joke about it myself and my mom were like, Paul, 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 Paul. I'm like, girl, that's the only line well, she said. That's like in Poltergeist 3 when a third of the dialogue is screaming Carol Ann repeatedly through hallway after hallway. Yeah. The Poltergeist 3 drinking game, do a shot every time they say Carol Ann, you will be blackout Amy Winehouse dead in five minutes. Well, funny enough, um, a friend of mine was like, we'll do a drinking game for the podcast of this. Every time you mention Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> we'll take a drink. Speaking of Jamie Lee, speaking of Miss Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah, but it's neat because I was looking at, I have my- Also, my... also, in all three, uh, the first three Halloween movies, did you know that? Because she she's the voice of- Yes. That she's thing in Halloween. She's over for, it's nine o'clock, it's nine o'clock, it's curfew. And I'm like, it's Jamie. So, but also, um, technically, so is Nancy Loomis. She was obviously dead for a minute. Yes. In the second one, but also, um, they show her body being wheeled out in part yeah. two. Yeah. And, and then also, they play entirely in part three. Yes. And also, um, yeah, she's a very motherly person. But also, the kid in that I recently became friends with, Joshua. He's going to hate me for not remembering his name. Joshua something. He was the kid in um, the beginning of Halloween 3. And he wrote a screenplay with his French Quebec boyfriend called The Final Girls in 2015. Did you see it? Wait, the, there's, there's two films called The Final Girls. There's a terrible one with Abigail Breslin. No, not that one. And there's one great... Get, the, the second one where they get sucked into the movie. I love that film. I love it too. He doesn't like it so much because he says a lot of it was changed during the filming and that's possible but I have a soft spot because I a I watched uh, Lisa Kudrow's The Comeback and I love oh, yeah. I love um Juna character she's the, obviously the mum in that while an actor and she's really sweet yeah so I love that film I think the music's the music I downloaded the music's fucking fantastic Terrific. yeah and also I just thought it was smart it was really smart how they approached it. The actors were all great. And I, I genuinely, as soon as Betty Davis I started playing at the end, where she was like, you have to let me go. Bawling my eyes out. Or even when they get sucked into the film, the daughter um, sees her mom for the first time waking in the up in the, the film in the back of the car. It is so beautiful. It's like a feel good slasher movie. Yeah. No, it's genuinely touching at the end. Yeah. And plays mm -hmm. with the convention tropes of the summer camp horror genre. I mean, I wish it had a bit of a bigger budget, but the photography is great, the ideas are great, the cast plays it to the hilt. Yeah. Um, I and it's like- the, the slutty girl who like, it gets all tied up, and she's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's <just> <laughs> dense. Amazing, and I, I should so, get the names up. Where's my phone? It's a horror movie fans horror movie. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I wish people, more people knew it. I wish Camp Bloodbath. <gasps> ah! <laughs> it's so good. So, the thing is, and I love that that movie ends with the setup for a sequel being set in a hospital a la Halloween 2. Why did that not happen? Why aren't we going to get it? I want that movie. Should we write it? Wonder, Should we just do it? Yeah. Okay, like, Hey guys, we're taking over your characters. We're gonna write a movie. We we're, just, we're good at writing right now. So we're just gonna go ahead. We're in quarantine. We're in quarantine. We're gonna write it out. We're gonna make well, Resurrection the way it should have been done. I was thinking, I think it's neat that the tagline on this four set is John Carpenter, master of fear. Only because when you look at someone like John Carpenter and Wes Craven and Toby Hooper, George Romero, the legendary horror directors. Mm -hmm. They have these amazing successes and then they have their like... Yes. The problem is I think these 
these amazing directors um, made such monumental films in general, but horror films too. They, they were horror films, but they were, they were amazing. The thing is with them, they, like a lot of people, even in the, the other industries like music, are, are sucked into what's happening now. And not yeah. all of them can kind of keep up only because yeah. um, it's it's a real case of where their head is at and where they're kind of from. Like Stephen King, yeah. a lot of his stuff can seem kind of dated, but that's only because it's kind of what he's drawing on. Yeah. The problem with that is I don't know if like a lot of actors, they don't get work. They're like stars to begin with and they don't get work. And then they just take whatever is given them. So there may be directors of just bad products that they just are being offered. But they want John Carpenter's last film being The Ward. And it's like, I mean, there's a couple of good shots. He, he has a couple sequences that he puts his stamp on. But you watch it and you really, if you didn't know it was John Carpenter, you wouldn't be like, oh yeah, this is a sensational thriller. But yeah. West had a great comeback with the Scream franchise. And then when we got like, what? cursed my soul to take and it's like i mean red eye was good red eye was a great little claustrophobic thriller he no, did very, very yeah really yeah and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great movie on the plane yeah that was him that was wes craven man here i am spouting horror knowledge and not knowing shit well, yeah, it doesn't it's a Wes Craven film that like my mom and dad have seen which is like, probably yeah. the only one. well that you know music of the heart oh what the fuck is that that sounds terrible oh that was um that was the Meryl Streep violin teacher movie it already sounds unless it's like a lesbian subplot I'm not interested there are no lesbians it's yeah. about te inner a white woman teaches inner city kids how to play violin <laughs> She should not have done that. That's, uh, that sounds horrific. And like Wes Craven directed it and you're like, but why? why? You know what? I, I applaud artists coming together and trying to make something, even if it's hot you... and what the fuck? <laughs> What's your, your favorite Carpenter film is Halloween, obviously. Absolutely. Uh, but I, but uh, it, 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 absolutely Halloween. But I have yeah. a very close second, and for me, that's The Fog. And I know for a lot of people, they don't rate it as much. I think it's, I don't look at it as this hardcore, gory horror movie, yeah. or even a, a massive thriller. I look at it just like a camp fire ghost story. And it's so beautifully done. Yeah. It's so, there's so many interesting um, plot threads within it. To me, it's a wonderful story. And I like that it's short. It's not drawn out. It's like, it's not even 90 minutes, I don't think. And how do you not fucking love A, Tom Atkins, Jamie oh. Harris, oh. Loomis, Janet Lee, Adrian um, Barbeau. Adrian like Barbeau. Barbeau. I know Jamie has a funny time talking about this movie. <laughs> obviously, it was straight off the back of Halloween. She became obviously very close friends with uh, Deborah Hill, and oh, at that point they were together. And obviously, I'm not sure what have happened or the time length between the production of that movie and then the next one, where he ended up. He worked on someone's watching me or someone, the TV movie oh. with Jim Barbo. Yeah, yeah. So they obviously fell in love at that point. So the, there might have been a crossover. There might have been some cheating. I have no idea. That's bullshit. I mean, it's unfair. But I, I remember. Jamie obviously being the forefront and the, the most pivotal point of Halloween. So she was very much involved with his filmmaking and then finding it that she wasn't as much in The Fog. She was a very secondary character and it does oh, yeah. that. And it, because he wrote her in because he was upset that she wasn't getting more work after Halloween. Yeah. And that's kind of it how great. it was, yeah. I love the um, the fog effects as well. Like there's the use of the miniatures and it coming really? over the mountain. It looks Super genius. Great. Yeah, and it's neat because you I mean it, it, those effects haven't actually dated that badly. And then you look at something oh. like Escape, 
A, and it's like the worst CGI ever committed to um, cellular. Practical over digital every time. Always. I love that sequence in the fog. I think it's that moment where like at the stroke of midnight, all that shit goes down, like the explosions and the Lord. fire. Oh, it's so good. And it works as like, like a campfire ghost story, an 86 minute little spook fest with a great musical score, great photography. And I have this weird fetish when it comes to movies. It happens only several times, but also not in, even in horror. Like I love character-based driven movies where people are via peril or just by circumstance are thrown together in a small space and you get to know these characters interacting together. It happened in the birds when they were in the diner before the explosion happened and then uh, you find out they're blaming to be Hedron, but like they're talking about it and you're meeting all these interesting characters. The one who was talking about the birds, the old lady, then you have it in the fog when these, uh, you have Nancy Loomis and Janet Lee coming up from one car, you have Jamie oh, and Tom Atkins going to the church from them. You have obviously the priest, like these people are meeting in circumstance. I love those moments in movies, but yeah. also it happens in like the breakfast club. These people are like yeah. in detention, they're random people, but then somehow find this connection. I love it about in life and when it's portrayed in movies. Yeah. But for me, well, it's, I, it's I, a special place in my heart, for sure. The reason I like the Dawn of the Dead remake is, I mean, there's too many characters, so it's hard to spend much time with them all. Um, you get more time with them in the director's cut. But again, like, you get this little handful of exceptional actors that are doing just that. It's like a bunch of strangers who through horrible circumstances have been brought together and romances blossom and little relationships blossom and rivalries come out because there's the tension of like we wouldn't be together otherwise but here we are stuck together and we have to make it, it becomes a microcosm of society in the diner in the church in the detention hall on saturday afternoon that to me is great filmmaking All clear. Nothing above, nothing below. Uh, what about Max? Adobe, right? Oh. <laughs> this is not happening to me. Max! Max, what have you done? 